Introduction Several years ago, I published a typology of hypocephali. This was followed by a typology of their rim inscriptions. I also published a methodology for interpreting hypocephali in their ancient Egyptian context. This method has four steps. 1. Use ancient Egyptian identifications of the figures from hypocephali. 2. See how ancient Egyptians understood these figures so identified with sources contemporary with hypocephali. 3. Determine again from contemporary sources how the figures are related to each other to determine why the figures might be placed as they are on hypocephali in relation to each other. 4. Match figures with texts relating to them. At the time, I completed only the first step. Part of the problem with the first step is that certain figures appearing on hypocephali are not clearly identified. For example, the figures appearing in the center of the two upper registers in types 3 and 4. For their identification, a different route must be taken and what will be presented here should be viewed as a hypothesis for further testing. Astronomy In this inscription around the Dendara zodiac, it is thrice called the heaven of gold. From this fact, A. von Leeuwen suggests that the phrase heaven of gold, um, ein, say ein terminus für runde Himmelsbilder. Hypocephali 2 are round, and Book of the Dead 162, which discusses how to construct them, says that they too should be made of gold. One certainly is while others seem to be imitations of gold, such as bronze or yellow-colored linen. Can hypocephali be interpreted astronomically? Type 5 hypocephali certainly tend in that direction, but the majority of hypocephali fall in types 3 and 4. I propose to look at those texts in light of astronomical temple inscriptions from Esna and Dendara, to determine if such an approach sheds any light on their decoration. Rather than start with an improvable hypothesis, though, I will start on methodologically solid ground. First, however, I will provide an overview of some basics of Egyptian astronomical concepts. I'm not interested in following Neil Gabar and Parker's footsteps to determine how accurately or inaccurately the Egyptians may have made star measurements, but we'll focus on, folk, we'll, but we'll discuss what A. von Leeuwen calls religious astronomy. At least some Egyptians seem to have an idea that when a person died, if the right rituals were performed, that person became an Ach, a glorified effective spirit which in Greek was called an angelos, or angel. This ach, because of an ancient play on words, was seen as the equivalent of an ich, one of the shining lights in heaven. At death, the individual would go to the field of reeds, which was the band of heaven, just, south, just to the south of the shineha, the, plan, the path where the sun traveled, or the ecliptic, our zodiac. This band south of the ecliptic is also known as the band of Deccans. The Deccan band is distinguished by its disappearance from the sky for 70 days at a time. This would happen as they set in the sky just after the sun and would last until they rose just before the sun. The 70-day period matched the mummification period. Thus, one's death date determined which Deccan one was in, which might be one reason why Deccan clocks are found on the lids of Middle Kingdom sarcophagi. Deccans that did not appear in the sky at any given time were identified with the demons. At the end of the 70-day mummification period, when the person was being buried, he or she was rising as a glorified Ach to light up the sky in the field of reeds. 
The Egyptian astronomical view was also fundamentally geocentric. The pharaohs constantly described how they were able to rule all that the sun encircled. But to encircle, whether Shani, Pachur, or Dibin, also meant to control or govern. Thus the Ach joining the stars or the sun god on his bark also encircled the earth and would control things on earth too. With this background, we are ready to return to hypocephali. The cow, one of the most constant figures in hypocephali, appearing in most examples from types 1 through 4, as well as 7 and 8, is a cow. This cow is identified as Ihetwert Misra, the great cow who bore the sun. Precisely such a figure is discussed in the astronomical ceiling of the temple at Esna, not entirely surprising considering that she plays the major role in the Esna temple cosmology. Quote, The very great cow who gives birth to her children through her rites, the guardian of her houses, who creates the two encirclers in her form of the golden cow, the great horizon which lifts up the two lights in her belly. She has driven out darkness and brought light. She has lit up Egypt by what came forth from her. She is the divine mother of Ra, who created light through her creation, who created what exists after her creation, who caused Orion to sail the southern heaven after her, who sealed the dipper in the northern heaven before her. She is Newt, who carries the stars, pertaining thereto with her orbit who strings the bow so that the Deccans tread in her place. End of quote. So in the hypocephali, the figure is labeled the great cow who bore Ra. And the Esna text explains that the very great cow who gives birth to her children is the divine mother of Ra. This matches the figure identified on its hypocephali with the same figure discussed in the astronomical ceiling. So... Methodologically, we can use the Esna text to elucidate the figure of the cow on hypocephali. The image described here is of a golden cow who bears or creates the two encirclers or two great lights, being the sun and moon. Um, these drive out darkness, bring in light, or light and lighten the land. She is also connected with the stars, fixing them in their places and orbits. She acts as a controller, governing, orbiting, or revolving around, encircling, and thus governing other stars, which in turn encircle and control what happens on Earth, particularly in Egypt. She is explicitly connected with the horizon, but at the same time, since she has give, driven out darkness and she has lit up Egypt, she is identified with the sun. Thus, the figure is horizon, sky, and sun. While we might like to find a convenient one-on-one -on -one matching or allegory, the Egyptians have explicitly explained this figure as having multiple meanings. After all, the Egyptians described the hypocephalus itself as having multiple meanings and purposes. Quote, If this goddess, referring to the cow, is placed for you at the throat of the king on earth, he will be like a fire after his, his enemies on earth. If it is placed for you at the throat of a man after his death, he will be a god on the god's property, and he will not be held back at the gates of the netherworld. This figure also appears in the temple of Dindara, where the goddess Mut is said to be the great cow who bore Ra, who made men and caused the gods to come into being. Hathor, who as Hehu gives her a nemes crown, is also described as the mistress of all the gods, the great cow who bore Ra, who commands the processions of gods and men. Thus, in Dendara, as in Esna, the great cow who bore Ra is equated with creator goddesses, who create and thus command gods and men. The astronomical connection is not explicit here. Yu Verhoeven has argued that various aspects of cow goddesses are intertwined. One, the great heavenly cow as firmament and cosmic-oriented space. Two, the Ihet cow, which, 
that represents the sun god and places him on her head. The three, the running or lying Ihet cow, which bears the sun, and four, swimming Ihet cow, which places the child between her horns to transport it through the flood. Having worked out one astronomical con connection using ancient Egyptian identifications, we can at least look for others. Behind the cow on Hatpasuf lies a female figure with a glyph instead of a head. The glyph is a circle containing a wedja eye, which stand, which reads Irit Ra, the Eye of Ra. This figure should then be identified with the Eye of Ra, a term which identifies dozens of female deities. The Eye of Ra is perhaps best known for her role in the story of dis the destruction of mankind, a role that at least matches one purpose of hypocephaly. Again, if this goddess, referring to the cow, is placed for you at the throne of the king on earth, he will be like a fire after his enemies on earth. Some have suggested that the Eye of Ra is a designation for the sun. In Esna, she is described as follows, quote, Hail, children of Ray, who appear when he sets the primordial council of the gods who encircle in his footsteps every day, the living souls of the gods every day when they encircle in the Eye of Ra, messengers in cities and districts who shoot arrows from their mouths against those whom they see from afar, end of quote. The children of Ra appear to be certain stars. Avon Levin claims that they are the Deccans, which makes some sense, but one would expect that if they were encircling the earth in the footsteps of the sun, that they would follow the same path in the sky that the sun does, which would make the stars the zodiac rather than the Deccans. Von Leven would also like to amend the text to say that the children of Ray come forth from the Eye of Ray, changing Pahur to Perur, citing a text, parallel text and claiming that Pehur ergabe auch kenensin. The reading significantly changes the astronomical understanding of the passage and the identification of the astronomical aspect of the Eye of Ra. If the verb is pahur to encircle, then the stars encircle in the Eye of Ra, making it the sky. If the verb is peri to come forth or heliacally rise, then the stars come forth from the Eye of Ra, making it the horizon. The form of the verb given as perur is problematic, as that form can only be a second tense, but von Leven gives a better solution in the footnote, suggesting that the per sign was mistakenly written as an R, which would give the expected reading of per rather than perur. Here again, we see the same multiple identifications with the Eye of Ra, being either the sun and the sky or the sun and the horizon, the same possibilities outlined for the cow in front of the figure. This matches a passage in the Book of the Dead 17 where the cow who gave birth to Ra is said to be the Eye of Ra. The Four-Headed Figure The central figure from Hypocephali of type 3 and 4 also makes an appearance in Esna. Here, however, hypocephali do not make a consistent identification, but the Esna texts give us something else, a description. Not as solid as an identification, but still fairly distinctive since four-headed figures are less common. Uh, these are, there are four texts which discuss this figure. The first description is Esna 431. The king, the noble image, chief of all the gods, Kanum Ra, Lord of Esna, the great globe that appears in heaven, who crosses the skies, a manifestation with four heads on one neck, the hidden one, whose form none knows, who comes forth from the abyss, that appears in flames, the great flyer in heaven, whose might is greater than all the gods, whose rays bring earth to the highest heaven. The second description is Esna 405. Ra is shining in the east to mount to the highest heaven. He flies and shines without clouding. Kanum, Lord of heaven, who shines within it who lightens heaven with his rising, who makes the stars shine when he sails in the sky to the horizon. His two lights are opposite his holy place. He has united with the divine God in his name of Kanum the Great, shining in unknown word, who unwarily crosses heaven and places himself in the horizon as a manifestation 
with four heads on one neck, his holy image being Sobek, victorious and expelling Wamempti in his moment. He moors in the land of the living. He returns from heaven on earth daily to unite with the global image, with the noble image. End of quote. The third description is Esna 441. Uh, he lightens the land thereof with his rising, the reviver, through, through whose light throats breathe, everyone rejoicing to see him. He crosses heaven as a manifestation of wind every day. In his perfect form of a fourfold manifestation of four heads on one neck, he stops in his procession at noon, creating and standing and sit and sitting of the manifestation of the gods in the temples and the manifestation of Osiris on the sixth day. He slaughtered the rebels. He smote Apophis. He caused his enemies to cease existing. If he exists, eternity exists. If eternity exists, he exists. For eternal is his name. End of quote. The last description is Esna 449. The gods and goddesses are happy. The people praise his face. The chief of the temple stands at noon with four heads on one neck to create standing and sitting for those guarded in the shrines by the, his command when he was vindicated against Apophis. He caused his enemy to, to cease existing. His rays control the banks of Horus, making those who breathe live by seeing him. End of quote. Thus, the figure is connected with the highest heaven, being the highest who crosses heaven. He thus encircles and controls everything beneath him, as well as creating the gods, and thus he is lord of heaven and chief of all the gods. And his might is greater than all of the gods. Though he is the hidden one, whose form no one knows, yet he makes those who see him live. He is depicted as the sun, and yet the sun and the moon are two lights that belong to him. The two-headed figure. The central figure of the top panel also has no clear and consistent name in hypocephali and does not appear in Esna, but something very much like it appears in the Dendar Zodiac, that something is a two-headed figure holding a staff. He is identified as Pernatur Ndua, the god of the morning, or Venus. He, along with Mercury, is conspicuously absent from Esna, although the two-faced headed figure is the standard representation of Venus in the Ptolemaic period. Even at this time, the iconography is not consistent, nor is it clear that the name of Venus changed from Sabah Da, the star that crosses, or simply Da, the crosser, to the later name of Punitur Ndua, the morning star. The sons of Horus. Off to the side of the cow are the four figures named in hypocephali as Imseti, Happy, Duamutef, and Kebesinoef, the four sons of Horus. These are known from the Book of the Dead 17, which was still very much attested in the Ptolemaic period, to have been four of the seven stars in the Big Dipper. Which of the seven stars bear these four names has never been determined, but one might suppose that if one were to specifically were to specify a group of four stars set against the other three in the group of seven, then it would make sense to see the four as the bowl of the dipper, while the other three are part of the handle. Since the list in Book of the Dead 17 splits into a group of four and a group of three stars and lists them in a specific order, it suggests one of two possible sets of identifications in the stars of the Big Dipper. Matt Martin Raven has also demonstrated that the Sons of Horus were originally connected with the orientation of the cardinal directions. Such can also be seen in the Middle Kingdom Canopic cases published by B. Lucier. It also appears that those cases that it also appears from those cases that the individual sons of Horus are not connected with any specific direction, but simply the four directions in general. Now, as part of the stars in the Dipper, which we are presuming forms something like a rectangle. These sons of Horus would point to various directions, but over the course of a night, as the Earth rotates, the heavens will rotate through the sky, thus making it so that the direction to which an individual star points in relation to the others would also change. 
So that might be the reason why there is no attempt at a canonical matching of a particular son of Horus with a particular direction until the site period when a number of other attempts at standardization are noted. Although Book of the Dead 162 may, goes back to the early 21st dynasty, hypocephali are only attested as early as the 26th dynasty. This makes them site or post-site when the directionality of the sons of Horus had been fixed. These directions, however, are mainly used in relation to the earth and what we term its four quarters. Thus, even these figures come in four... One more time. Thus, even these figures come in for multiple astronomical interpretations as stars in the Big Dipper, as the cardinal directions, and as the earth itself. The bird in the boat. Figure four is labeled on hypocephali as Bibio, as Babau or Bibio. The name seems to indicate the soul of souls, but the second half of the name, Bio, is the name is the known name of a Deccan. In an initiation ritual called the Eighth Book of Moses from a Theban priestly archive, Bibio is the name written at the base of the zodiacal sign. It is also invoked in multiple lamp divination texts that invoke the sun and moon. In a vessel divination text, Bibio is called Son of Newt, an epithet describing many deities. In a solar oracle, Bibio is invoked and asked to open heaven to me in its breath and death and bring the pure light. These references indicate that this figure is connected with astronomical phenomena. Conclusions Each of the figures on the central axis of hypocephali of type 3 or 4 can be connected with figures appearing in astronomical texts appearing in Egyptian temples, two certainly so, one probably so, and one possibly so. Though the identifications are suggestive and certainly would give reason for connecting some of the figures together, they do not add up to a single identification or system. But a single system of identification is out of the question to anyone who considers the data. Eight different types of hypocephali are known, reflecting different major decorating themes. I have noted previously that hypocephali seem to be connected with both astronomical figures and lamp divinations. The instructions for the use of hypocephali in Book of the Dead 162 identify two different results from using them, one for living royalty and one for deceased individuals. Why should we expect one interpretation? For the deceased individual possessing a hypocephalus, it would serve to allow him to pass by everything that might hold him back at any gate in the next life. It would become a passport, a sign of authority, almost a map of the next life, and something of a star chart. John Gee, Brigham Young University.